Welcome to Here We Are, Brattleboro's community talk show. I'm Wendy O'Connell, here with you again this week. And today our guest is Mary Lauren Fraser. She's an accomplished basket weaver. She also teaches workshops, gives talks, and she's connected to the Green Burials Movement, where her beautiful handmade willow coffins and urns inspire and influence. Mary's also a fiddler and enjoys a good contra dance. Welcome, Mary. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm so glad to have you on the show. Your name has come up a, um, a couple times over the last months. There was a wonderful article in The Reformer about you um, by Kathleen Hawes, I believe, who did yeah. a series. Um, so yeah, thanks for taking the time. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you are born in Quebec, but you didn't stay long, and you ended up in the valley, down in yeah. Deerfield Valley. I grew up in Deerfield. Mm -hmm. And your family, was your family from there, or were they Canadian? Canadian. Uh-huh. Yeah, my mom was originally born in Maine, but also was only there a couple of years and grew up in Quebec. Mm -hmm. um, and they got a job as co-directors at a Quaker retreat center called Woman Hill, which is in Deerfield. Uh -huh. And that's, we got to live there as well. Oh. So that's where I grew up. Uh -huh. Did you have siblings? I do. I have a younger brother and an older sister. Mm -hmm. So you're right in the middle. Yeah. Growing up, you were homeschooled for a bunch of that time. Yeah. Yeah. Most all of it. <laughs> really? And it was it the three of you together? Um, no, my sister went to school all the way through and then moved to Quebec to live with her dad uh -huh. um, when I was eight. And my brother and I homeschooled through until I was going into high school and he was going into middle school. Mm -hmm. And then he went to the Four Rivers Charter School in uh -huh. Deerfield. And you had a little bit of a Waldorf education in there? Um, kindergarten oh, that's and funny. half of first grade and then I dropped out of first grade. <laughs> Your first grade drop I'm a first grade dropout. <laughs> when you were pretty young you started studying and playing the violin. Five, yeah. Five. Yeah. And it was a classical training? Yeah, I did classical violin from age five through seventeen. Mm -hmm. Did you enjoy it? I did, yeah. Devoted? Yeah. I mostly loved it. Uh huh. Yeah. A lot of practicing, right? A lot of practicing. Was it the Suzuki method? I started on Suzuki and then I switched and had a teacher who um, was all more like reading from sheet music uh -huh. and um, in high school. Yeah. What so. did you like best about it, about the, pl the violin playing itself? Um, it's the endless work like you can always get better at it there's uh, no like finish mark yeah with music mm -hmm. and same thing with weaving too or art there's like no end really you don't like graduate uh -huh. so um, your skills improve over time yeah mm -hmm. there's always something new to mm -hmm. discover and work on and get better at mm -hmm. and um yeah it's I think that's what I like most about it, and it's fun. And at some point, um, early 20s, maybe before, uh, you started traveling a bit and going over yeah. to the UK. Yeah, I traveled out of the country on my own for the first time when I was 20. Uh huh. Yeah, and I, that was for music and to just to travel and explore the mm -hmm. world a bit more. Mm -hmm. um, so I was at that time playing a lot of Scottish fiddle music uh -huh. and I have the Scottish ancestry so I was drawn to Scotland yeah. um, but also spent time in Wales and Ireland and England. Mm -hmm. What about the transition from studying classical to going into and learning the ancestral roots and also the traditional part of fiddle playing? Uh, it kind of felt like brain yoga for several years. Yeah? Yeah. Felt like I was. I had to shift my ear quite a bit, uh -huh. um, and relearn how to learn music by ear. Because I started that way as a child, but uh -huh. then I read music for many years, mm -hmm. like ten years, and then all traditional music is mostly learned by ear. Yeah. So I would go to like sessions and jams and just very, very slowly get better at learning by ear uh -huh. and like hearing what to listen for in traditional music, which is very different than what you're listening for in right. classical music. When does a, a violin become a fiddle? 
Uh, it's exactly what you're playing on it. So <laughs> classical music, generally, it's referred to as a violin. Mm -hmm. And traditional music, it's a fiddle, but it's the same instrument. The instrument is the same. Yeah, I've always wondered about that. Yeah, yeah. I get that question. <laughs> Do you? <laughs> i got to say, by the way, just to interject, um, uh, we will mention um, Mary Lauren's uh, website at a, a, a couple times during the show probably, but there's a wonderful, she has a couple great videos. One of them is her fiddling uh, while she's ice skating. And was it the Retreat Meadows? It was Lake Spofford. Oh, Spofford, Spofford Lake. yeah. It was yeah. like black ice, but yeah. it was, it's a beautiful video. It was so, fun. So you're traveling around, you're, um, you're spending time uh, where your ancestors were in Scotland, mm -hmm. the Frasers. Um, and you were close to Findhorn, Findhorn mm -hmm. Echo Village for a while. Mm -hmm. You ended up at a farm close by. I was staying in Forest, which is like the little town over from Findhorn. And I was staying with my friend whose housemate was doing a bunch of hide tanning in my, what, my basket teacher's workshop, uh -huh. which was this big pole barn. And um, so they were just sharing the space there. and. She mentioned to me that, that she was there and with this basket maker and I should come and visit. So that's how I met my teacher. Uh -huh. And while I, when I went back and did my apprenticeship, it was like three, a little over three months long and full time, like four to five days a week of weaving in the shop. And then she'd do a lot of fairs. Most weekends mm -hmm. we'd be going to a fair and packing up the van and driving and setting up. <laughs> So in the course of your apprenticeship, Mary, um, what was compelling you? Because you kind of fell in love with basket making. Yeah. 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 I'd wanted to do it for a long time. I made one basket when I was 10 uh, with dogwood and really wanted to keep doing it, but just forgot and did all the other things I was into. And then when I met her, I was like, oh, yeah, I've been wanting to do this. Mm -hmm. It's great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you picked it up pretty easily? Yeah. yeah, it's it's hard, no matter what. But I've I've learned pretty quickly. Uh huh. And how did you get introduced to making coffins? I uh, first time I walked into the shop, there's one sitting there that she was working on, and that was like uh, really awesome. When I saw that, uh -huh. I was like, oh, I have to do that. Uh huh. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Yeah, so it was it was the coffin itself that compelled you, like realizing something about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of all of it. Yeah. All of it meaning? Like how it felt to walk into the shop and see her working there and see the coffin and know what it was and have like a very visceral reaction mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I love doing things with my hands so that it all kind of downloaded and uh -huh. I was like, oh yeah. <laughs> Could you give us a little description of what it was like for you, your experience of weaving a coffin? Um, the first, I made two coffins with my teacher during my apprenticeship after making probably three dozen baskets of other kinds. Mm -hmm. And she worked with me on both of them. So she set me up for the base and then I just wove the base mm -hmm. which was a full day and then the second day you weave all the sides and uh, you have to finish the whole thing because the uprights will dry out oh. and they become the top border so you have to do all the side weaving in one go. You're working with bigger willow it's like seven between six and eight foot willow so mm -hmm. at the butt end the thick end of the willow it's it, some of them are like as thick as your thumb mm -hmm. so it's pretty intense to work with yeah um but i my hands kind of get stronger like in the apprenticeship my hands got stronger weaving all those baskets before doing the coffin mm -hmm. um and then the third day is making the lid and that also, she just kind of set me up with it, and then I went for it. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really fun. Well, a big basket. <laughs> really big basket, right? <laughs> yeah. You talk a little bit about getting your hands in shape to do it mm -hmm. after doing X number before you do a, a larger piece. Um, do you continue with having to keep your hands in shape in any way? Uh, I probably should. <laughs> yeah. 
so far I've woven seasonally um, because I've been working outside for the most part and soaking willow outside. Um, so I can't do it in the winter. And I generally just start a little slow, like I'll do one or two coffins the first month and then do some little baskets with the leftovers mm -hmm. and just kind of work my way, do lots of hand stretches, mm -hmm. make sure my hands are warm when yeah. I'm weaving. You have different types of willow. You plant some willow as well. I planted right? this year. You did? Yeah, just about 400 plants, which hopefully will be enough for like two, three coffins a year. Mm -hmm. And then uh, several smaller smaller things for workshops mm -hmm. or smaller baskets. Mm -hmm. Won't start harvesting what I planted for about two years. Uh-huh. Yeah, so right now and throughout the last seven years, I've pretty much bought almost all the willow because uh -huh. I go through so much every year mm -hmm. and wild willow is kind of tricky to work with mm -hmm. and, and weeping willow doesn't work for weaving. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, so I buy mostly from a farmer in Ohio, um, Howard Peller, and it's all organic. Mm -hmm. And um, the different kinds of willow really just make, they're all, they're all kinds of basket willow. So there's like hundreds of varieties of basket willow. Really? And um, they just make different colors and they weave a little differently. Mm -hmm. They soak a little differently. They need yeah. different times mm -hmm. to soak. Um, but they're all, for, yeah, they're all for baskets. We haven't talked about green burials yet, but if this becomes a more popular thing, um, I know that you teach other people as mm -hmm. well. So that's part of kind of your mission. Yeah, I teach basketry. I haven't actually, I've had um, just two people so far come and learn how to weave the coffins. Mm -hmm. And otherwise I teach between five and eight basket workshops a year. Uh-huh, at various places, but mostly yeah. around this area. Yeah, right? in New, New England. England. Could you talk a little bit about um, uh, what what it's like for you personally to weave a coffin? I know, again, you know, we mentioned that sometimes people come in to help you, mm -hmm. but um, you had a beautiful piece on your website about um, just sort of your presence there and as you're, as you're making the basket itself, making the coffin itself, what you're thinking about. Um, well, hmm. whenever I'm finished weaving them, I always get in them and I lay in them and it kind of feels like I'm in a cradle. It's really comforting. It's kind of hard, you know, on the back, but if you're dead, you don't feel that. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, so, and it smells really good. And while I'm weaving it, it's kind of fun to imagine all the different little bits of someone's life as being um, the different rods that are getting woven in. Uh, yeah. um, because it is, our experiences are kind of like woven and like the way that our memories work and time just gets, I think like the older you get, it just gets mushier and like <laughs> yeah. becomes more of this woven thing and gets bigger. Your life gets bigger. Yeah. And, uh, and I don't know, I'm not like very old yet. <laughs> um, but definitely imagine that kind of thing a lot. And, um, it's, it's cool cause it's, it's empty. It's like I'm making a vessel yeah. that's empty. So it's kind of funny to think about like what that actually is. And I really like that it's, it's, it's like this movement. It's like you're dancing. You make this thing and then it disappears. It goes in the ground. It rots. It's just made of sticks. Yep. And I love that. I love that I don't have to carry my work in, in physical form yeah. after I make it mm -hmm. that I can let go of it. Yeah. And um, that's like, it's comforting. A lot of people ask me, like, isn't that hard to, like, see this this piece of art or whatever, if this thing you put so much energy in, and then it's just in the ground or it gets burned in the crematory. But I actually love that. <laughs> I love letting go of it. Yeah. yeah. That's the cycle, right? Yeah. The cycle of life and death. 
totally. and disintegration. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and create yeah, and creation too. Right. Yeah. Right, yes. So then it gets to die. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It it sort of brings us to green burials in general, which I know that you've been um getting uh having more a, a part in. Um mm -hmm. and there's certainly um a movement going on that, you know, we start we're starting to hear a lot more about it. Mm -hmm. Um uh Andrika Donovan, who um did a series at BCTV, and it's 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 run on BCTV, and she's going to be continuing the series as well, and it's about home funerals and green burials. So folks can tune in uh, to that on um, Brattleboro Community Television. Um, it's a really she covers a lot of ground about all kinds of um, funerals and uh, funeral homes and green burials and cemeteries, et cetera, et cetera. That's so awesome. she's done amazing research, um, and. I know that um, the Vermont legislation has also changed. Becca Ballant has yeah. been behind some uh, some new laws about burial in Vermont. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was the first state to change the burial depth law to three and a half feet from six feet. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. In other states. And can you tell us why that's important? Yeah. Well, at six feet, there's not really much of anything happening in the soil. Um, there's not, the body goes down and sits basically clay most of the time, inactive soil. Body just sits down there and takes a very, very, very long time to change at all. Um, at three and a half feet is kind of the deepest level that the soil starts to be active, that there's microbes or mycelium a little bit that um, start to recycle mm -hmm. the body mm -hmm. and decompose it. and. Um, so that's a huge step in green burial, and I really hope that other states do that as well. Mm -hmm. Once again, Vermont is at the forefront. <laughs> 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 Who would have thought it would be about green burials, right? Yeah. Yet another great thing. And one thing about green burials is, is that it reduces a lot of environmental impact. It's definitely the most ecologically sound way to... Mm -hmm. to uh, do, what to do with the body. Um, cremation is probably the next best or like alkaline hydrolysis which is basically dissolving the body in lye. Some mm. people call it water cremation. Mm. Um, that's also pretty low, fairly low impact. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and green burial, green burial is the best because you don't have you you're not importing anything if you do it on your own land you're not even driving the body anywhere mm -hmm. if somebody dies at home you can just carry mm -hmm. them out of the house and bury them i i took a coffin up for a burial in maine um earlier this year and they had just dug a hole on the land they have like a hundred acre farm mm -hmm. and they just dug the hole in the land, they called the town, and they're like, what should I do? And they're like, oh, deal with it after. Call me <laughs> call me next week after you've done all of that. You know, you're in the thick of it. You're waiting for your brother to die. And so um, it was an easy process yeah. for them in their town. And um, and they, that one wanted like a, he, he didn't want the lid on the coffin. So they were just gonna like carry him uh, along the farm yeah. and and yeah. So there's a lot of options. It's much more accessible than funeral homes or the fu the funeral industry will have you believe. You know, a lot of funeral homes are not very honest because they're trying to make mm. the buck and um, will say that there's certain rules or laws or things you have to do that are in fact not laws or legally binding mm. at all. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm really glad that Green Burial is kind of starting to move. People are starting to talk about yeah. it more and more. When I started, people like didn't really know what it was yeah. seven years ago. So mm -hmm. in the last two years, in the last five years, it's really like started to move and people are realizing that they have a lot more power and say right. in what they can do with their loved ones and with right. ourselves when we die. Yes, yeah. yeah. And to have um, that option, which itself has many options to it yeah. as well. 
in terms of bringing people together. You also invite folks to come and work on coffins if it's someone, a loved one for instance, yeah. um, or for themselves and you do um, orders, yeah. people can order ahead of time. Well I do keep a stock of baskets because a lot of people don't plan. We're still, we're still in that kind of death phobic culture of like I'm never gonna die. Mm. That's not something that will happen to me and then have a lot of families that come to me and they're like, there was nothing planned and we're all tr we're trying to figure it out yeah, now. Yeah. And it's a lot of work. And um, so I always have some on hand because that's most of my sales are people calling and saying, my grandpa just died. I need a coffin yeah. tomorrow yeah. for the burial the next day. Yeah. So. And you don't do production, but you do have some on hand. Yeah. Yeah. Do yeah. you think that you could you would set up at some point to do production? Have three or four people working with you? Um, possibly. I don't see it happening for a while. I guess yeah. My question too is about your connection to it. You yeah. know how close your connection is to to. to that. Yeah, like I don't. I've had some funeral homes and people get in touch for wholesale, and I don't do that. Mm -hmm. um, probably I won't. Um, so if I ever did get to a level of demand where I could employ someone, yeah. I don't see that happening for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, the last two years I've sold, uh, six coffins per mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. yep. And before that I had sold four or five total yeah. in the five years before that. Right. So, so it's there's... been slow. Well, there's the livelihood aspect to it. Yeah, right? being able to maintain a livelihood and doing what you really love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would imagine that um, that also there's a whole emotional piece that goes with this. I mean, mm -hmm. you're dealing with people who are um, maybe they have the foresight to plan, and it's maybe not quite as emotional. But you are dealing with people um, who are grieving. They are dealing mm -hmm. with people uh, the losing a baby. You have baby coffins. Yeah. Um, did you do any training, or are you just learning it as you go along? I'm learning it as I go along. There's definitely secondary grief is an aspect, mm -hmm. especially with kids. Yeah. Um, yeah, with the other, like, when someone's older and it's expected, um, then it's, it's mostly just a very fulfilling thing to be involved yes. in. Um, or when someone's ordering their own cough and they're usually like pretty excited and we like sit and have tea and we just talk about things and uh -huh. um, so I'd say most of most of the time it feels just um, pretty normalizing mm. I would say mm -hmm. to have this personal thing that they're calling me up and they're saying you know, this is what I need and when I need it, here's where I live mm -hmm. and we just talk and it's just um, feels pretty natural. Well, the, you know, they're so beautiful and I know you also have on your website that, you know, you can um, order one ahead of time and you could have it as a coffee table, Yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. In your home. Totally. <laughs> yeah, or a sweater chest. Like I, I tell people it's just a basket. Yeah. Until you put a body in it. Right. Yeah. They are beautiful. Yeah. They're really beautiful. Going on a little bit, you play the fiddle, mm -hmm. and how, I know that you like contra dancing. So is that part mm -hmm. of your fiddle playing? Uh, it has been in the past. Um, I also love square dancing. I play mostly old time, so I haven't uh -huh. played in uh, for contra dances as much in the last five or six yeah. years. Yeah. Well, the pandemic as well. And that, yeah, yeah, I haven't played for any dances in yes. the last yeah. two years. Um, Have you missed yeah. it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I love playing for dances. And what about yeah. the community? I know the Greenfield community has a pretty strong contra dance group. Yeah, that, yeah. and and old time music too. Mm -hmm. And also here at Pierce's Hall, I think in East Putney, mm -hmm. they have contra dancing there. Yeah, I've played yeah. there. Yeah. It's a really cute, cute little hall uh -huh. over yep. there. Because I play old time, I'm more in that community, which is a little bit different. And what do you mean by old time? Um, old times like uh, s Southern Appalachian music, to put it the most simply. Mm -hmm. uh, but it encompasses a lot of 
different genres. It's kind of what happened uh, musically in this country when there was like African American influence, which is where the banjo is from. Right. Scots Irish influence mm -hmm. tunes and that fiddling, um, and indigenous to here. Yeah. And those three musical influences all mixed together and made old time. Uh huh. Yes. And yeah. so that that's so what you really you really enjoy doing that. Yeah, yeah. I mostly that's what I mostly play. Yeah. One other thing you do is you make crankies, mm -hmm. and um, I've had a couple of folks on the show who make crankies. Can you give us a quick description? We can yeah. run a photo as well. Cranky is, it's like a scroll um, with visuals on it, and it can be either like cut paper that's backlit, so it's like um, shadow art kind of. But it's basically this long panoramic scroll scroll that gets put in a box and you see one um, scene of it at a time and then it turns to the right. next scene. Got the cranks on the top, right? Yeah, yeah, you turn it from the beginning to end and it can be a song or a story or any or no narration at all yeah. or a tune. Um, you yeah. enjoy doing Thanks it, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're they're wonderful. Sandglass Theater I think has um, uh, different so cranky festivals almost I think you know mm -hmm. it's something that they've been doing for a while so yeah. many different artists are doing doing it in different ways it's um, very fun. you feel supported by the Brattleboro community yeah supported and what, what, what well, kind of support <laughs> well, <laughs> well like you had a great article in the paper so that's yeah. kind of nice support um, people uh, I guess um, you know who know what you do or who come to you you know, for either orders or baskets or, or whatever. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I grew up just half an hour south, so right. I've known people here my whole life as yeah. well, and still feels like home, kind of this whole section of the Connecticut River yes. Valley is. Yeah. Um, Big difference in climate. My community. It, yeah, but there also is between Brattleboro and like Newfane. <laughs> up the hill that's right or like it's all or like greenfield and shelburne falls yes right right once right. you get the elevation it's yeah. like a week different it makes a really big difference um thank you so much mary it's wonderful yeah. having you on the show it's wonderful hearing you talk about all of this and it does feel that one thing that that struck me in um talking to you and reading about the things that you're doing is that um both with um the violin or the fiddle and with weaving, you started with traditional mm -hmm. first, mm -hmm. you know, and then kind of made it your own. Mm -hmm. And so you, you learned the rigor of basket weaving, the, the rigor of uh, learning how to play a violin. Mm -hmm. And then you really translated it so beautifully. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a joy to talk with you. It's been wonderful. Thanks, thanks for thanks. having me. So thanks for joining us today. Um, it's been wonderful having Mary Lauren Fraser on to hear about all the different kinds of things she's doing. Um, again, I think this is someone um, to keep an eye on to see what happens. It's a changing, it's a changing industry. It's a changing world, and um, what she's doing is is helping in such a different kind of way and very accessible. Um, I also really encourage you to check out her website, which we'll have the information on at the very end of the show. Um, it, it really, uh, when you see the photographs and you see the little videos, you get a really good idea of what she's up to. So thanks for being with us. Um, tune in again next week. We'll have someone else from the community coming on and uh, continue to pray for peace. Thank you. Thank you.